Uh, my name is Javon. I work for a company called Basecamp, um, headquartered in Chicago. About 45 employees, um, 10 of them in Chicago, more or less, and uh, the rest of us work remotely. Um, I think one kind of interesting thing is we, uh, we use Basecamp to work as a remote company. So it's, it's something that we, uh, we all care about, we use every day, and um, uh, are kind of passionate about making better. Um, Basecamp, the company was formerly known as 37 Signals. Um, they changed their name this year uh, to Basecamp. Um, so I was just going to give you a quick history. Um, 37 Signals, uh, the company itself, I think is around 15 years old. Um, in 2004, they launched the first version of Basecamp. Um, and like shortly after that, David, um, who's one of the founders, uh, more or less extracted Ruby on Rails out of Basecamp. He had amassed this good uh, toolkit of stuff and turned it into its own open source project. Most of you probably know its history. Um, over the years, there are several more products released. Um, they're all still like humming and doing fine. Um, in 2012, we rewrote Basecamp uh, from the ground up. So it's a, it's a completely separate app from the original version. Um, it, uh, it uh, internally we were calling it um, BCX, just sort of a code name. Um, but eventually when we launched it, the new version of Basecamp became Basecamp. Old Basecamp became Basecamp Classic. Um, so if I say Basecamp, I mean new Basecamp. Um, and then in 2014, 37 Signals changed their name uh, to Basecamp. And sort of just kind of a, a signaling like they're they're going all in on, on their best idea. Basecamp's always been their, the, the biggest, um, biggest app and their biggest success. Um, so Basecamp, the company operates Basecamp, the application. Um, this is what it looks like. I, I saw like a few hands go up, but um, it's kind of just what the home screen of Basecamp looks like, in case you're curious. Um, I know this is a JavaScript talk, but I just thought people might be curious uh, kind of what the setup looks like, uh, the stack. Um, pretty standard Rails app and Rails stack as far as I know. Um, we don't really do anything uh, too unique or different. Um, and just because people like numbers, um, here are some numbers that Basecamp uh, produces. Um, kind of the more interesting ones to me are uh, about 70 million web requests a day. And they're all, um, the, the average response time is pretty fast, especially for a Rails app. So they're usually in the 50 to 60 millisecond range. And um, I'll, I'll kind of explain how we, how we get there. Um, on the JavaScript side, we use um, pretty uh, standard collection of libraries, jQuery, Backbone, Underscore, and um, all of our JavaScript's written in CoffeeScript. So, um, if you don't know CoffeeScript or you see something on screen um, and you're curious about it, just go ahead and shout out and I'll try to explain what it compiles to in JavaScript. Um, and just for comparison, um, we more or less have around 20,000 lines of uh, Ruby code in the app. Um, both of these are kind of fuzzy numbers because um, stuff comes in from external gems, but um, that is about right. Um, how many people work with Rails on a day-to-day? Cool. Um, so there's also, um, just because Basecamp is a big Ruby on Rails app, there's going to be um, some Ruby code mixed in. And if you see something that uh, you're curious about, feel free to shout out. Um, and I'll try to explain that too. Um, so Rails ships with something called the asset pipeline. Um, and it's built heavily on a gem called Sprockets. And it's a, it's a tool for um, compiling, concatenating, and compressing your assets. Uh, it does a fair amount more than that, but I just like that these all start with C. Um, the compile, um, by compile, I mean it, uh, it will process your assets through certain preprocessors. So um, if your JavaScript is written in CoffeeScript, it'll handle um, compiling that to JavaScript first. 
things like SAS um, and into CSS. Um, and the way that it works is by including file, um, files with extensions that um, define their um, compiler. So here are two examples. Um, the first one is just a, a JavaScript file that has a .coffee extension, which is the coffee script extension. Um, and you can actually chain these together. So um, if you were to add .erb on the end, you would go through first the ERB um, preprocessor, which is a Ruby templating language, then CoffeeScript, and then you end up with JavaScript in the end. Um, so this is just kind of a, a um, contrived example of how that um, would look internally. The, the first, the first um, code block there uh, would be a, a, a coffee.erb file, and those, um, those brackets are Ruby code. So um, what's neat about that is um, uh, when the ERB is compiled, you actually have your application's whole environment available to you. So if there's um, some sort of logic you want to share between your, your models and your, your JavaScript code, um, this gives you a way to uh, kind of easily um, compile your, or share really some logic from, from Ruby into your JavaScript. So this is just showing kind of the, the, the steps that would happen. Um, the ERB would be processed, you'd be left with the second one, which is just CoffeeScript. And then finally, you, you'd land on JavaScript at the end there. If anyone has questions, feel free to interrupt. Um, the, uh, the pipeline works, um, or one of the features of the pipeline, and sprockets really, are these um, require directives. Um, so these are actually just JavaScript comments. Um, that's a CoffeeScript comment. Um, so the, the pound sign turns into two slashes. So slash slash <laughs> equals is a, uh, is a um, sprockets require. Um, and so typically what, what you'll do in a Rails app is um, this will be like your main index um, JavaScript file. You'll define uh, your requirements. Um, so here you can see we're requiring, requiring all our libraries at the top. Um, you'll then, well, this, this is how we do it. Um, you can do it any number of ways. Um, but down below, we're requiring whole directories. So that's what the require tree does. It'll just traverse through and require all the files in there. Um, and that require self on top, actually, um, any, any code in this file below all of, or below that require will be placed basically where require self is. Um, so keep in mind, we're not actually loading any um, files here. We're, we're telling the, the pipeline um, basically the sequence in which we want all of our files concatenated in. Because in the end, we're just going to have one file. Um, um, and here, the require statements just um, declare dependencies on things that need to be required first. Um, so this is sort of like a, our main index, which would be a, a manifest um, of all of our, our code. But then within each file, um, you can use requires also to basically state their dependencies. Um, so here, I just this is an example. This is another contrived example. But um, this would just be, on the top here would be a CoffeeScript file. And it's just stating that. Um, Hey, you know, I need CoffeeScript or I need underscore, which is another, uh, an external library, to be present before this code runs. Otherwise, um, uh, at runtime, you'd, you'd hit an exception if this was required before. Um, so you're just um, as the pipeline moves through your whole uh, dependency tree, it makes sure that everything uh, is included in the right order and concatenated in the right order. Um, so down below would be sort of an example of what the concatenated version looks like. Um, so you'll just see the top is underscore, which is just minified. Um, and then down below, you have the compiled coffee script. Um, and one thing to note, every, every time, um, just by default, when coffee script compiles a file, it wraps all of its code inside of a, a closure, like a, a self-executing function. So um, all of your variables, anything you define is private by default, and you can see that happening down below. Um, so what's really nice about this, um, in, like the, the pipeline plus um, CoffeeScript is 
you end up with a system that's not too far off from, say, like require.js or um, even in Node, like requiring a module, where you require your dependencies and then you decide what you want to export. Um, and you would do that by defining something global. Um, so either on window or BCX, um, that's, our, that's our global app object that we, um, that we expose things globally onto. But otherwise, everything is kept, um, kept private inside of those functions. Um, so it helps, um, it helps to prevent just global leakage. You're not gonna leak variables or clobber um, other globals. And it makes you be more explicit about the things that you want to expose globally. Um, so if you don't work with Rails, don't worry about it. But um, this is just basically the small amount of configuration you need uh, in a Rails app to both configure um, uh, your, your uh, assets and uh, more or less deploy them. So at the top, we're just saying that we, um, we want um, the pipeline to add a digest to our file name, um, which you'll see below. Compress the, compress the concatenated file. And we're actually defining our, our CDN um, also. Um, this rake task below would be something that happens when you, uh, typically when you deploy your app. Uh, it compiles everything into one, um, you know, one JavaScript file, one CSS file. And then in your app, you can just use, if you've worked with Rails before, this is just a Rails helper, uh, you would include your JavaScript file and it would output the script. Um, so here we've compiled you know, hundreds, thousands of um, JavaScript files through any number of preprocessors and um, served them from a CDN with like, uh, you know, a very little uh, work. It just handles a lot of that for you. Um, so with Rails, typically, it gives you a few spots to put your JavaScript code um, and kind of leaves the rest up to you. Like, uh, it, you know, it's very picky about where you put certain Ruby code, but um, doesn't care too much about JavaScript code. So one thing it's really easy to do is uh, make a mess of your directory structure. Um, and it's not important that you see what all of these say, so don't worry about that. But um, we've been, you have to kind of make a conscious effort to, um, to organize your JavaScript. Um, and so you can just see here, maybe we're, we're, um, we're keeping all of our backbone code together. We're keeping our global um, behavior files together. I'll explain some of those. And we have directories for all of uh, the sections of the site, which um, most of these more or less directly map to a, uh, to a views um, directory in the Rails app, which more or less maps to like a feature uh, of the site. Um, and if you expand some of these, you'll see we have a lot of files in there, um, some directories more than others. But what we try to do is have um, fairly descriptive file names that don't contain too much code. So they're, they're, um, they're, they're all kind of single purpose. And this is sort of, this is an example of one of those files. Um, it's, it's, a, it's pared down from its actual implementation, but it's, it's typical of, of how we, um, write our JavaScript. Um, so I'm gonna just kind of walk through these things. Um, we often will set up variables near the top of the file um, that are just gonna be reused. Uh, often these are selectors that jQuery is gonna use. Um, and I don't know if, if <coughs> how many people use um, selectors like these, but this, this top one is a perfectly valid um, CSS selector. Um, the little squiggly equals will match um, any value within a space separated set of values on an attribute. So you can see the example HTML down below, um, this data attribute. Um, so this selector is gonna match that, um, those data attributes. And we use these exclusively in our JavaScript. Um, we, uh, we, we exclusively use data attributes, mostly um, one called data behavior. Um, and what's great about that is we never have any conflicts with our CSS. Um, class names, IDs, et cetera, are free to come and go. Um, and without worrying about breaking any of our JavaScript. Um, and, and kind of on the flip side, we don't ever match these kind of selectors in our CSS files. Um, 
And that has worked out great for us. We've never had any issues um, sort of uh, clobbering uh, JavaScript because of a design change or a class name change. And then almost all of our um, event handlers are bound to the document in this fashion. Um, so this is sort of, a, 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 these used to be called live um, event handlers in jQuery. I think that um, went away. It might have been a slightly different implementation. The idea is that you, um, you bind a document for the event that you want with a selector that you want to match. And when that event happens, wherever in the DOM, um, you know, events bubble up the DOM, eventually they'll hit the document. Um, and then jQuery is going to uh, look, look, look at that event, look at all of the um, handlers that are um, bound to the document that match the event type, find one that matches the selector. If it does, the, the, um, the callback is executed. Um, so this is like arguably probably like the slowest way you could do it. Um, every event has to bubble from wherever it's uh, originating all the way up to the document. Um, and these type of selectors may or may not be the slowest kind of selector you could use. Um, um, but in the end, it doesn't really matter. Um, JavaScript's fast, computers are fast. We've, I, I've noted there's, almost, there's probably no perceivable difference between binding directly on the element you want to target to the document itself. I mean, obviously there would be a measurable difference, but um, unless you have some incredible ton of, of nodes in your DOM, um, this works great. And what, what is nice here too is um, you don't have to worry about binding to elements as they're added to the page. Um, say, for example, you know, um, you load a new page or you Ajax in some new content. Um, you don't need to bind directly to them because all of your handlers are, are defined on the document. Um, and just kind of uh, proof of whatever, um, I, I just was curious. We have like around 300 of these data behavior um, attributes that were all bound to document and um, no, you know, we, we, we haven't noticed, there's no perceivable slowdown and I, there probably isn't much of a measurable slowdown. Um, so I wanted to kind of pause for a minute and just um, define or talk about the term single page app. Um, I think when most people hear that, or at least what I had always thought of, um, would be a JavaScript heavy app that doesn't do full page re refreshes and typically um, renders uh, client side. So they often will uh, use an API, make requests, pull some JSON down from an API, do some stuff with that and render HTML client side. Um, and um, they're known for being very fast, um, having really responsive UIs. Uh, I think these are just like characteristics that you hear in common with uh, single page apps. Um, and Basecamp, I would also consider a single page app, but we do things a little bit differently. Um, we render the majority of our HTML on the server, and we send that down to uh, uh, all of our requests are more or less for HTML. We're not, we're not serving up JSON. And um, um, we also don't do full page refreshes. So once you load Basecamp.com, any click, or uh, probably most clicks, um, you're never gonna do an, a full page refresh. Um, but you get the, you kind of end up getting the sense that you did. And I'm gonna explain how we do that. Um, and, and the advantage of that is every time you do a page refresh, even if you have um, your JavaScript and CSS, you know, cached locally, your browser is still reinterpreting that with each request. If you can avoid doing that page re refresh, you skip that reprocessing step. Um, so this is what Basecamp looks like um, when you click on stuff. So we're gonna click on a to-dos and click on a list and click on a to-do item and you can see you get this, this page stacking uh, UI. 
Um, and that is, um, let me just play one more time here. That's all powered by what we call Stacker, which is just our internal library to handle all of this. And um, show one more little video and then explain kind of what it's doing. Um, so this time, we're gonna click through the same number of, of pages, but then hit refresh to see what that looks like. And you'll notice when we refreshed, the stack is a lot shorter. Um, and this is what that actual page looks like uh, if you were to fetch all of its HTML. Uh, it's only one, it's, it really only has one uh, sheet in the stack. Um, and so the way Stacker works is um, when you click on a link, it fetches that page and then it looks for the sheet on top and it stacks that, it just extracts that part and stacks it on top. Um, and that's sort of the default behavior. It has, it has other um, um, characteristics. It's not always just gonna keep stacking sheets. But um, that's the concept there. And I'm gonna show more code in a minute. Uh, Ruby on Rails, yeah, yep, model view controller. Um, we render all of our HTML in the views um, using, it's not, it's not dissimilar from how PHP would do it. It's just a different uh, organization of code, I suppose. Um, so one more video here. Um, I added a two second sleep to the, to the app to show you what it looks like if you were to get really slow requests back. Um, and you can see um, even though the requests are pretty slow, it doesn't, it doesn't feel as slow. Um, and, and one thing you'll note is, um, I'm gonna play this video again. When you click on something, the UI responds immediately. Um, or near immediately. It's not waiting for that request to finish before you see new content. So you'll see when we click on a link, um, the new sheet is drawn right away and the old sheet becomes the back sheet um, and, the, and the content starts loading in the middle, um, which is a much nicer feeling than click, wait for the browser to do something, there's the new page. Um, so even if Basecamp was slow, which it isn't very slow, um, this sort of UI trickery um, helps it feel fast. I'm gonna play this one more time. So click, and we are gonna get this new sheet, but the, the request hasn't finished, now it finished. Got the new sheet, now, and then you'll see down in the inspector, the request finally finished. Uh, and another trick that it does is if you visit a page that you've been to before, it loads it right away. It, it, it keeps a cached version of it, uh, client side. Um, so what happens is, when you click on a page that you've been to, that cache version is uh, drawn right away. And then in the background, we make the request. If we get a 304 back, we're done. If we get a 200 back, we actually replace what was on the screen before. Um, so it's this little kind of subtle, um, uh, I don't know what you would call it, but UI stuff makes it feel fast. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I'll give a, an example of that right, right now. Um, so this is a super stripped down version of how Stacker um, interacts with the app. Um, but you can see that it, um, it's, it's listening to click events on all links. Um, it's gonna look at the target of the, uh, the href um, down here in match click event and compare it, see if Stacker needs to, to uh, step in, so if it's the same origin. So basically, did you click on a link to Basecamp? Great, we're gonna use Stacker. If not, um, we're done. Um, and then we're gonna do kind of three different things. Um, we're calling visit here, so that's sort of the last thing. Uh, number one, we use push state to change the URL right away. Um, so uh, push state is a um, browser API to control uh, the history, so you can swap the URL. Um, we update the layout, so that's why you're seeing the, um, the new sheets being drawn immediately. 
even though we don't have data yet to put in it. And then we actually make the, the last thing, I know it's hard to see maybe at the bottom, but um, we fire off an AJAX request for the actual page. The thing that we changed to? Right, um, I think I can go back to that one. So here, here um, so we did a push state, push state, push state, and we added all these sheets. Now hitting refresh is basically doing what you're talking about, right? Going straight. Is it still refresh from the URL? Nope. Um, so this, is, this URL just is a real URL in the app. Like uh, this is what that page looks like when you request that URL. It's the same URL that Stacker requested as an Ajax request, but when Stacker was doing it, it's parsing out only that sheet, not the whole page, and just putting that on top. Um, so one thing that happens um, is that you no longer have in jQuery what would be like your, your, your ready event, um, because that only happens once. Uh, your, you know, your page loads, and then you can't rely on that event to find out when somebody changed the page anymore. So we emit these custom events, um, um, page before change, which is um, like as soon as you click on something, basically you're about to change. Page change is an event that is fired after the page has changed, and page update is for um, partial uh, page updates. So if you say uh, an Ajax request that wasn't stacker related, updated some content, we get this custom event page update. Um, and then we, uh, we have our own sort of custom uh, event handlers. So um, that bcx.on is, is the same as um, sort of saying document on, because these events are all fired to the document. Um, but they have a second argument, um, which is just a description. Uh, it doesn't do anything except self-document um, what, it, what, what it's there for. Um, and so we use these all throughout our um, JavaScript files. You know, we'll say uh, on every page update, apply some behavior to the elements on this uh, on the page, on page change. You know, something similar to that. Um, but what's nice about running these all through um, our custom event handler is we can um, we can do some really nice debugging. And I, it's okay if you can't read this, but um, this is the console. Um, in development mode with the debugging on. So because we've documented all of our event handlers, um, we can then uh, instrument them and get a readout of how long each one took and which ones happened. Uh, so you know we can see the before change, page change, and page update events. This is just loading one page. Um, and a lot of, you know, a lot of stuff happened. Um, they're all very fast. Uh, but this is a great tool for us internally to um, debug, see if we have a slow point, um, et cetera. If any of this looks familiar to you, if you used a newer version of Rails um, or other libraries like that, um, this concept was, oh, sorry, go ahead, question. Yeah, or dispatching an event on the, to the document. So you could just construct a new document, uh, or sorry, a new event, which is something you can just do in JavaScript um, with a custom name and um, just like fire that at document. Yep. Uh, that's something you can do really easily in, in jQuery too. Um, they just have like a trigger. So you can just trigger, um, you can just make up an event name if you want to fire custom events. And then you can, um, conversely or whatever you can bind to those events and um, um, it's, a, it's a good way to sort of communicate um, across JavaScript files sort of by, um, by having these custom events. Um, so this uh, stacker was sort of inspired by a library called PJAX. Um, it's a jQuery plugin that GitHub I think still uses. So a lot of time if you use GitHub you'll notice a lot of their things will update sort of the file browser or um, uh, clicking like different tabs will change the URL and replace some content, but they're not full page refreshes. I'm pretty sure most of that is still PJAX. Um, 
And then if you've used Rails, um, Turbo Links, which is on, I think, by default in new Rails installs, is, um, is, is a lot of what you saw in Stacker. And it was, it was um, sort of born out of Stacker. So Turbo Links gives you the, um, or prevents um, full page reloads. It gives you the push state, updates the title, um, and the difference is it does actually replace the entire page, but it's doing sort of a fake reload. Um, and uh, it has the same event name, so if you had seen those event names before, you'd probably use TurboLinks. Um, so one issue with, uh, another issue with single page apps is um, because people aren't refreshing very often, they could leave their browser tab open for who knows uh, how long. If you want to change the assets, you write some new JavaScript. Um, you need to get people to load them somehow. Um, because if they're never refreshing, they're never going to pick up the new JavaScript or new CSS. Um, and the way that we handle this um, is sort of twofold. Um, the first, the thing up top here is just a um, console. It's just a Ruby console for our app. But it's showing that we have these, um, these digests for all of our assets. So the asset pipeline, um, by default, is giving a, it's appending this hash to all of the file names. I'm pretty sure that hash is based on the last modified time. Um, so whenever you change an asset, you get a, new, a whole new file name. Um, and so that handles a lot of problems with uh, caching um, because it's just a whole new file name. Your browser is just going to reload it. Um, and so what we actually do is every Rails request, we set a, um, a header that includes our, um, the, the digest file names for our JavaScript and our CSS. Um, and then in our uh, JavaScript, we have this um, event handler uh, down at the bottom there. It's uh, the Ajax success um, event, which is something jQuery uh, gives you. So it's basically every, uh, it lists, you get an event for every Ajax request. Um, we get that, we get the header that our, our app set. We compare the asset URLs um, currently on the page, which are like our script tag and our link tag, to the ones in the headers. And if they're different, we know there's new assets. Um, we tell Stacker, uh, you set Stacker history false. We're basically telling Stacker to stop working. So it'll stop capturing all of our, our clicks. So the next time anybody clicks on anything, they're just going to do a full page refresh instead of a stacker request. Then they'll get the new assets, then the stacker's back on again. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Uh, is this all about the rolling? Yep. Uh, that is also a feature of TurboLinks. Um, I think because TurboLinks um, is a Rails gem, yeah, I believe it sets the same or similar headers and works the same way. Um, I know it's a feature. I don't know if it works the same way. But it, it, will, it will do that full page refresh for you. Um, so if you'll remember back to the video I was showing, um, clicking those links, even when I wasn't in the slowed down version, um, the pages load really fast. Um, I, I think compared to most Rails apps I've worked on, Basecamp feels fast. And um, part of the reason that uh, we get it to be so fast is everything is cached, um, and cached on the view side. Um, so this is a, the Basecamp project page, and it's just showing you, this is a technique in, in Rails, or I don't know if it's just a Rails technique, but it's, it's become known as Russian doll caching. So it's this whole nesting of little cached um, fragments. Um, so you can see uh, each, each colored box is a separate cache. Um, and this isn't all the caches on the pages. I just wanted to really explain um, from a to-do list standpoint. But you could pretty much draw a box on every single thing on this page. So um, each individual to-do item is cached. It's cached. Um, its to-do list is cached. All of the to-do lists are cached together. And then the whole project is cached. Um, and what happens is, uh, on the Rails side, when you change a to-do, uh, if you rename it, complete it, you're going to touch its timestamp, so it has an updated at timestamp. And that will sort of set off a, a wave of uh, updates 
all through their parent records. So the to-do list will get updated. Um, and then, uh, I guess there's not that many here, but so you touch a to-do, it touch, touches its to-do list, and then that will touch the project that it contains. So you're expiring those caches all the way up to the project level. Um, and on the surface, that feels really expensive because um, you're blowing away your, your, your cache every time. But the cost to regenerate the, the whole project cache is almost nothing because you only expired one little thing. You're rebuilding it from um, a bunch of cached things and one expired thing. Um, and I know that is, has nothing to do with JavaScript, but um, that's, that's probably half of why Basecamp uh, is pretty fast. And it's gonna lead into some JavaScript here. So this is another page. This is a, a comment thread. Um, and it's the same caching setup. The whole page is cached. The message on the top is cached. Each comment is cached. Um, and uh, you'll, you'll notice that there's things in here that you typically wouldn't cache. Um, um, the timestamp that says posted three minutes ago. You can't cache that because it won't be three minutes ago in a minute. Um, and um, things like the, uh, the one on the bottom too, there's an edit and a delete link. Um, and that's visible to the creator of the comment for 15 minutes. And then they're not allowed to edit or um, delete their comment anymore. Uh, whereas if you're logged in as an admin, you're gonna see those links um, on every comment because you have the power to edit or delete uh, anything in the system. Um, and if you want to get good uh, performance out of caching, you can't, um, you can't have a bunch of separate caches for all these different people. Um, theoretically, you could um, have a different cache for each time zone or whether or not you're an admin. But then you blow away the effectiveness. So um, the way that we do it, this is a, um, this is a view in um, as our comment view. Um, you can see we're caching the whole thing. Um, we're posting, um, we're, we're caching the, uh, you'll see that local time ago tag down below. And then you'll see the, uh, below that, um, the, the uh, those are helpers, but the edit and the delete links. They're cached right in there and they're on the page for everyone, in the DOM anyway. Um, and then we use JavaScript to basically tailor the page to the person viewing it. Um, and I'll, I'll walk through how we do some of those. So here's um, a few screenshots of just a few comments. <clears throat> and you can see I'm hovering over that one and it's revealing um, the time in my local time. Um, so what we do, th this helper, this local time ago um, helper, it, it creates a time tag, which is an HTML tag. Um, the, the date time attribute is that created at in UTC time. And that's the only time we ever cache. Um, and then this title and the, the, the uh, content right now, those were substituted in um, using JavaScript. Um, so basically, uh, when we get one of those page events like page update, we look for all of the elements with um, this data local time ago, parse this UTC time, and then, um, and then display it um, depending on, um, so this could either, in this case, we're asking for relative time, um, but in the other examples, um, that sort of fades into becoming a specific time and then a date. I don't know if you can see the other one. Uh, well, so this one, uh, the first one has a, uh, an actual date and the, the, the one on the right is just um, the amount of time ago. Um, all of this is open source. If you're interested, um, we have a gem called local time. Uh, it's sort of built to work really easily with Rails, but the, the JavaScript um, uh, could easily be repurposed. Um, GitHub actually just sort of repurposed it and they use something real similar for their local time. Um, similarly, um, all of those comments had the edit and delete links um, cached in there, visible to anyone um, who would you know, who might be inspecting the DOM. And um, we do that by setting these attributes. Um, you can see in the span there, data visible to. So we're saying that those links are visible to any admin or the creator of that comment. And if you look at the parent element, it has a, a data creator ID. Um, and this uh, jQuery down below is an example of something we run on every page update. So, um, 
We get a list of the types of people that it should be visible to. We parse out the, that creator ID. Um, and then we basically say, okay, if, if this is visible to an admin and you're an admin, we're done. If it's visible to the creator and you are that creator, we're done. And if we don't stop there, we remove the element. So the, those uh, edit and delete links just vanish from the page. That happens uh, you know, in, imperceivably. Um, it's not like you see it and then it uh, blinks away. And of course, this is like no measure of security. This is just tailoring the page. So on the Rails side, uh, we then just would enforce that should someone, um, that, the, that the person um, uh, following through with those actions actually has permission to. So this would be an example controller in Basecamp. Um, we're just running this before action, um, ensure permission. Uh, so the, the, same, the same types of um, uh, rules are in place, like uh, is the person an admin, are they the creator, and has it been less than 15 minutes, things like that. Yeah? That's just a custom thing, that, it's a methods that we have on our people models. Uh, there's a ton of gems out there for doing um, author or, uh, authorization like that. Um, I can't think of one off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, that can change method with that we're passing a comment to knows the same things that um, our JavaScript knows, but it's the ultimate gatekeeper here. Uh, getting near the end. Um, so I mentioned before that we use uh, Backbone. Um, I'd say we use Backbone lightly. I'm not sure how to define it really. We're not a Backbone app, like um, the whole app is not done with Backbone, but we rely on it really heavily in certain areas. Um, the, the, the main area that we rely on it is our calendar. Um, and just these, these boxes here outline um, individual Backbone views. Um, and there's a number of Backbone models at, at play here. Um, and and in, in this example, you know, the frame is still all our server rendered HTML, but everything um, you see inside of a box was rendered on the client. And some, um, and, and the reason we turned it to Backbone here and do things client side is things like a calendar, um, they have a ton of really intricate little UI, um, lots of little things that change and move. You can see we've got, you know, calendar events, which you can drag and drop, and then an autocomplete thing, and then date pickers. Um, and those things become um, much harder to manage without uh, some sort of structure in place, and Backbone has been a good fit for us uh, in that regard. Yeah. No, just backbone. Um, here's just a couple more examples that are um, less obvious. These are just little backbone views um, inside of uh, the project. And um, another one, like uh, the whole page is HTML, but this little tagging UI uh, is all done in backbone. And this is gonna be a lot to digest, but it's sort of how our um, backbone views um, come to be. So on the top we have a, uh, one of our Rails views. Um, that helper basically bootstraps all of our um, calendar event models. So we're, it eventually just becomes a script tag that um, sets up a collection of the calendar events. Um, so uh, we're not fetching, uh, we're not doing a request to an API to get our calendar events, we're just dumping them onto the page. And then um, we define our containers using, using this uh, auto view um, and if you can follow this here, um, we have, uh, so it's data auto view name is calendar display. We create backbone views that define, um, that sort of claim that name. You can see they extend a, a custom class that we have here, which is auto view. Auto view extends backbone view, and um, it basically knows how to find its classes based on uh, uh, a name, which was calendar display. So we, at, you know, at the very end here, one of those custom events you saw, we just look for elements on the page that have uh, an auto view name. We use our auto view class to install the backbone view. It's automatically rendered. Um, so there's once once this is all in place, we're really free to just set up um, new backbone views easily. Um, backbone kind of makes you go through quite a. Uh, it's a little bit verbose uh, installing. 
view sometimes, and this is just our way of uh, making that easy. We use a um, templating language on the client side called Eco. Um, Eco looks a lot like ERB, if you've ever used ERB. Um, so this is actually client side um, templating code, um, and it's a, it, it's more like a, it uses CoffeeScript, and it's modeled on um, ERB. Um, so what's right, what's really nice here is there's no, there's no like mental context switch when you're working. Uh, I, I personally, I'm not a fan of a lot of the JavaScript templating languages out there. Um, this feels really natural. We already work in CoffeeScript. We already work in ENB, ERB. Um, uh, so this uh, feels really natural for us. Also, everyone at the company, including all of our designers uh, or anyone who works on the apps, they're all contributing to the views. So we have designers and programmers um, all writing a lot of code, but um, having this almost common language with our server-side templating language has been a big win for us. Um, Eco is uh, created by um, my coworker, Sam, and is open source. Um, I think the last topic um, I want to go over is how we, um, how we keep two pages uh, in sync, or two users in sync. So uh, if somebody changes something, how do we make sure that the other people are seeing the same thing on their screen? Um, so I have live in quotes here because for us, that's not, it's not important that that happen at the very instant that somebody changed something, but it needs to happen pretty soon. So it's not like a chat application where it's acceptable to have a few second lag after someone types. Um, but we do eventually want everyone to see the same thing on the same screen. Um, so I'll just show that quickly. I've got two browsers up, two different people logged in um, looking at the same page. We had a comment, eventually it shows up there. This is a separate user over here. He's a jerk and decides to delete the comment. Uh, and we'll eventually see this one go away. Um, and we do this um, basically through polling. Um, each person with an active session in the browser um, is polling our polling server. Um, around every three seconds. Um, we, um, it's, uh, they don't pull against our Rails app. We have a, a really tiny uh, rack app that serves like a billion requests a minute or something. And, um, and they're all super fast responses, but um, every, so every user of Basecamp is constantly pinging Basecamp saying, is there anything new, is there anything new? And I'm gonna show you how um, how we put things into that polar and what you get out of it next. Um, so this view on the top is sort of uh, what that comment thread would look like in our Rails view. Um, you can see we're basically just rendering a bunch of comments, uh, that commentable comments. We're just rendering them, we're looping over comments and rendering them. Um, and then this JavaScript at the bottom here, when you create a new comment, this is the JavaScript response that you're gonna get back. Um, and so we've got a jQuery selector. It's matching um, the, the container for, um, for the comments. And it's rendering that comment and appending it. And then just flashing it with a little highlight. Um, and the way that, so this is just me creating a comment. When I post to Basecamp, it sends me back this JavaScript which appends my comment to the bottom of the page. I'm still good on the computer. Oh, there we go. Um, so the way that we share those, um, share that JavaScript with everyone else is um, basically capture the JavaScript with this helper, this page updates helper, and we stuff it in a Redis queue. And um, those queues are all more or less scoped by a project. So whenever you're visiting a project, the polar is just saying, hey, anything new in this project? Anything new in this project? And it's going to just give you back all this raw JavaScript. Um, and what's great um, is it doesn't really matter where in the project you are. Like if you're not on this page and you get this JavaScript back, 
just to the nature of jQuery, because we're matching the, the selector on the top here, um, if, if that's not found on the page, append it, the append is gonna do nothing. Um, so we can basically just pull all of the JavaScript that changed recently, and if it applies to the page you're viewing, great, it'll work. If not, you'll just see the new thing when you browse there. Um, and then similarly, the, uh, the calendar has the same um, sort of live updating mechanism, um, except that this is all done in Backbone. So same thing, we're seeing the changes on both sides. Changing it on one side is gonna change it back on the other side um, eventually. And we do this in a really similar way, except that um, uh, instead of sending back raw JavaScript, we just send back um, uh, the, the, basically the um, backbone models. So we ha this is the response, this is what we're stuffing into uh, the polar, which eventually cooks down to this JavaScript, which is just adding that updated um, calendar event um, to the collection on both sides. And Backbone handles all of the re-rendering when it detects changes like that. So we're just sending um, updated models back and forth. Um, so the last thing, um, it's basically the end of the talk, but if anybody's interested, um, I thought we could pull up a page real quick. Um, some of you asked for invites earlier and responded. Um, I'm just gonna put up this uh, Basecamp account on screen. Uh, if anyone's interested in like sending some inappropriate stuff to the projector. Um, if you didn't create an account and you have a computer here, um, you can log in with this guest account, um, Javon plus SEMJS at Basecamp. Password is SEMJS, SEMJS. Um, and I'll pull that up and we'll see how that goes. Javon plus semjs at basecamp.com. So in theory, these were, is anyone doing anything? Semjs, semjs, all lowercase, all, no spaces. We won't let this go on too long because I know everyone doesn't have a computer here. Um, I'll try in just a second. There you all are. Uh, if you're all logged into the same guest account, um, you won't see live page updates from yourself. So I guess that's kind of a if you're sitting there watching your screen, I mean, not much is changing, that's why. Um, any questions just while we have, uh, yeah.
Backbone is all client side, so um, it's just a it, it's a JavaScript library. Um, right, you're never yeah everything every part of Backbone is just served in our uh, JavaScript bundle. Has nothing. There's no um, Rails component to it. I guess what may have been confusing there is we're um, we're comp we're we're uh, generating some JavaScript on the server side that uh, is Backbone code, but we're sending that to the client. Exactly. Yep. We don't. Nope. I mean, not like uh, out of any principle. No. It's um, so it's it's actually not push. We're polling against. Um, so it's a real simple like uh, I forget, it's like a set interval or set timer that's just hitting a server with an AJAX request. Yeah, uh, we kind of I mean we have a long history of polling. <laughs> we kind of understand how to, how to how to scale it. It's not long polling. We're making very fast short requests every three seconds um, to get the to get the latest updates. Um, Nothing against, um, uh, you know, uh, WebSockets or service and events. I don't know if I could compare it really well. The one nice thing is it's really reliable. Um, you don't have to worry about connections dropping because it'll just try again the next time that loop comes around. Uh, with WebSockets, it's great if once while the connection's open, but you still have to deal with issues like retrying and uh, reopening the, the, the connection. Um, it could very well be that it's less resource intensive um, to do uh, you know, web sockets, but um, I guess our goal hasn't been resource savings. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's an internal, um, it's a library, it's a JavaScript library. Um, we could just call it Stacker internally. Um, it's a, you know, it's a bunch of JavaScript. Um, we, the, the primary reason I'm, we haven't open sourced it is because it, a lot of what it does is manage the UI of Basecamp. So it's responsible for that stacked page look. Um, everything else about it, um, we've, we've sort of, contributed um, to this library called TurboLinks, which is um, part of Rails. So the ideas are there, but Stacker is closed source. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so for selectors that we're using in our JavaScript, we exclusively use data attributes. Um, we never will uh, say select against a, a class name um, to like add behavior or bind to or something like that because those are so um, brittle. Like they're easy to they're easy to mess up because it's easy for, say, a designer to want to change a class name or change the HTML structure. Um, but those data attributes just have special meaning for us. Like when you see that, you, you know there's probably some JavaScript involved. If you see a class name, you know there's some styling involved. Right. Um, so that is just a perfectly valid CSS selector. Um, if you have you know, a div with data dash behavior equals foo, you could um, use the same selector that we're using in our JavaScript in your CSS files. Um, you, can, you can match on any attribute. It doesn't have to be class. Right, right. Um, so yeah, they do, but not for, not for matching elements as uh, using like a a selector. So um, browsers do have like a, you can read the data off of an element. Uh, they have a data set or jQuery has a, a data method for setting and retrieving data from an element. Um, but as far as matching a set of elements, 
um, using one of those selectors, um, you just treat it kind of like it's a class name.